That's actually what we've been talking about, communicating during this entire series. Show me, God, how to spend my life, how to live my life. And some of you are really enjoying life right now, right? Summer is here. You feeling good about that? Summer, you're not feeling good about that? Well, people are enjoying, you know, the great outdoors. They're enjoying God's creation. And we, uh, with weather like we're having right now, I think it's a little bit easier to uh, believe that every day is a gift and we want to get the most out of it. Uh, but in getting the most out of it and enjoying this time of year and enjoying life, uh, I only have one little glitch in that. Do any of you have cottonwood trees? <laughs> cottonwood trees are from hell. I am convinced that they, I, in fact, I believe cottonwood trees are going to be in hell. Because, I, I mean, my neighbor's cottonwood tree has ruined my landscaping. I want to keep a good testimony, good example, but I was tempted the other night to chop the sucker down. You know, make up like some thunderstorm came through. Hey, there was no rain. Oh, there was in your yard. You're the only one. You're, you're unique. But uh, I'm glad that life isn't all about cottonwood trees and some of those inconveniences because we've been in this series, Live Out Loud, and we've been talking about a transformation taking place in us, being transformed, living as God intended us to live. And God is saying in this series, I have so much more for you. I have a way that you can live. There's a whole lot more to get out of life. And how is that possible? Because of Jesus Christ, who he is, what he's done, what he's accomplished, and how he wants to accomplish it in our lives. And we've been asking this question, what if, would you say that with me? What if? What if we were all in? What if we were all in like the lyrics of that song, with our time, with our talents, with our treasure? What if we were all in, connected with the creative God who created you, who created me, and he wants to use the gifts he's given you in a creative way? Now, when we use that terminology creative, a lot of times people go, well, I can't do art, or I can't be on stage like one of the musicians. No, it's not saying that. It's just saying that if we're all in, what if we connected in a creative way with that creative God so he can expose to us how the gifts that we have, the purpose that we have, can be used in a creative way in his kingdom. So then we discussed, how does that happen? We assume the best in people. We bring value to people. We empower people. We have, in fact, um, a discerning spirit rather than a judgmental spirit. And by the way, if you missed any of these because of travels or maybe you're visiting and you want to catch up, you can always catch this either audibly or you can watch it on our podcast. We then discussed what does it mean to make life better using the gifts God's given us to look at the best in others connected with that creative God, but it takes a teachable spirit to do that. That's what we spoke about last week. This week, uh, there were some things that were brought to my attention that I, I didn't get defensive. I said, you know what? I have to hear some things in that. And there was an individual who attends our church who I love this individual. I love this guy. But I had seen some things in his life. And I said, hey, can we get together? Can we go out to lunch? And can, can I talk to you about a couple things? And I didn't know how he was going to respond. But I want to tell you, he had a teachable spirit. It wasn't, I don't need to hear that. Why are you telling me that? And you know what that took? That took humility. What we're seeing, if we're going to be connected with the creative God, if we're going to look at the best in others, if we're going to make it better, if we're going to have a not know-it-all spirit, but a teachable spirit, it takes humility. And all of these characteristics are characteristics of anyone who would call themselves a follower of Jesus, a Christian. And so today we conclude with what the New Testament, the early followers of Jesus, it was a characteristic that they had in their life, and it was this, give it up. Generosity. And so for, before we go any farther, uh, let's just uh, have a word of prayer and see what God wants to do. Father God, may we be open. 
Open our eyes to see what you want us to see. Open our minds to absorb what you want us to absorb. Open our ears to hear what you want us to hear and give us the will to obey whatever you speak to us about today. We pray it in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so we're gonna talk today about give it up. Give it up. Let the generosity flow. Some of you are going, is this a talk on money? Yes. Yes, it is. I'll just hit it. Is it a talk? It's, it's, but the, our attitude towards money will also be our attitude towards our time and our talent. In other words, it's let go rather than hanging on tight. We're actually doing this series in conjunction with Grumlaw Church up in Grand Blanc, who we've helped start. And my son and I were talking back and forth. He's the uh, lead pastor there. And a lot of times, people go, nah, the reason that I'm not going to go to church is all they talk about is money. Now, there are some people that may be in that category that that may be true. But if that happened 15 years ago, Bible also says don't hold a grudge and forgive. All right? But the most of the people, it's an excuse. They just don't want to go to church and they use it as an excuse. Now, for instance, some of you may have gone to it. Don't want to offend any of you if you went to it. And it because I was invited to it, there were some hints to go along. You know, the Rocket Mortgage golf uh, event that's taking place today. And there, I could tell people I didn't have the money. I could tell people I was too busy. The bottom line is this. I don't want to go. I can't think of anything more boring walking around and watching other people hit a golf ball. You can't give me enough hot dogs. You can't give me enough drinks. You can't give me enough anything. It's like, are you kidding me? I mean, I'd go grab the caddy's bag and just start whipping clubs at that thing. I'd go nuts. So the same way, why doesn't a person just be honest and say, I don't want to go to church. Stop using the excuse. I just don't want to go. Now, is that a good choice? No. We know that if we know Jesus. But the, can I just tell you this? Can I share this? In the Bible, there's over 800 references to money and giving. It was one of the biggest topics, top three, that Jesus spoke about. If Jesus spoke about it regularly... We need to speak about it regularly. You know why? Because this. Jesus spoke on it so much because he knew what ha would have the grip on people, their stuff, their possessions. And the Bible's very clear. You can't serve God and money. It's not both and. It's either or. And so to put this in perspective a little bit, uh, I don't know this guy personally, but I was touched by a story. Uh, let's take a look at a doctor. When I started this clinic, I was hoping that more doctors would follow my lead and join me maybe even part-time, but no one did. And in fact, over the last eight years, it seems like I've become somewhat of a pariah or an outcast. When I used to work in the ER, I was making good living, very comfortable. We saw a number of uninsured patients, and uh, I recognized that a lot of these patients were, were my neighbors. Some of them literally my neighbors. People like barbers, sawmill operators, workers at convenience stores, mechanics. I had to see these people every day who I know could be treated more compassionately, more cost-effectively in another setting. I felt like basically even though I was working in the ER, I was walking around them and I was not being a neighbor to them. I kept asking myself the question, is this what a good Samaritan would do? I really sensed in my heart that God wanted me to provide medical care for these people outside of the ER. And who was I to question what God wanted to do? Uh, about eight years ago, I opened Patmos Emergent Clinic uh, to provide care for the uninsured. 
On average, I have about 5,000 patient visits a year. About 60% of those don't have insurance. About 25% uh, have uh, high deductible commercial insurance. So how are you feeling today? Didn't sleep very well. Did you take your blood pressure medicine this morning at all? No. No? Okay. I took it. All right. A lot of people thought what I was doing was foolish, and they probably were right. Uh, in the eyes of the world, I think it is foolish, but God has a, a different strategy. He tends to choose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. Taking care of the uninsured, that, that's the ultimate foolishness in healthcare today. The last eight years trying to more authentically be a follower of Christ is um, a lot of times a struggle. struggle Financially, I've foregone quite a large amount of income. The struggles of recognizing that my skills are deteriorating from the ER. But the biggest cost really would probably be with my kids because I've foregone putting money aside for their college education. My kids didn't have a choice in that. And that, that, that bothers me. I wonder sometimes if it's really worth it. And I could work maybe a shift or two in an ER a week and do as well financially as I am now and have a lot more time off to do other things, spend time with my family. Don't know. How you doing? I've been worried about my toe. This morning, it was swelled and throbbing real bad. You weren't going to go to the ER. Uh, the reason you weren't going to go to the ER is well, I mean, that thing needs to be fixed. Expensive. Expensive. Hey, I'm being garnished for 12 years ago. Well, let's take a look at it. That's tender right there. Is it still sharp out press there or just hurt? Well, it's just in certain places. I'm going to get you basically 20 days worth of this medicine to take twice a day. All right. Let me get you a work excuse. No. <laughs> <laughs> Joe was a guy who um, got good care who wouldn't have gotten good care. That's, that's satisfying. He would have been another invisible casualty of our healthcare system. Somebody who would have fallen through the cracks and somebody I was able to help. Take it easy now. I'll do it. All right, stay safe. It's been worth the risk, I think, because I kind of afraid of the type of person I would have become had I continued doing what I was doing, to become more hardened and callous and willingly blind. That's an example of somebody who's all in. That's an example of someone who is connected with the creative God using the creative skills that God gave them to think of the best in people, to be discerning, non judgmental, to make judge, non judgmental, to make things better had a teachable spirit, just didn't keep going on the trajectory that they were headed and said, I'm all in. What penetrates me about that story is when he said, we're unsure now of our daughter's college education, but he's trusting enough to know that God will provide. And so today what I want to do, I want to take that as a template, as a background, along with an incredible story from Jesus, and I want to make several observations about generosity using a story from the life of Jesus. You can read along with me. I mean, just follow along as I read it. In Mark 12, 41 to 44, Jesus sat down near the collection box. That's very insightful in and of itself, in the temple and watched as the crowds dropped in their money. Many rich people put in large amounts, then a poor widow came and dropped in two small coins. Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I tell you the truth, this poor widow is given more than all the others who are making contributions. 
That created something among the disciples that we'll talk about. For they, they gave a tiny part of their surplus, but she, she was poor. As poor as she is, has given everything she had to live on. You know what's interesting? I really do feel that it's important to share this, that I wish I could tell you this time we planned on it, we thought ahead, and sometimes we do. But there, it, 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 we did not plan that on our final day of our fiscal year for our budget that would, we would have a talk on giving. But God did. We did not manipulate this in any way, shape, or form. You can also read this story found in another one of the Gospels in Luke, Luke 21, 1 through 4. And they'll both unwrap the same way, but let's unwrap this a little bit so we can make some observations. Jesus sat down near the collection box. Isn't that interesting where he sat and he was going to be able to see where people were really at? in the temple, and he watched as the crowds dropped in their money. R many rich people were putting in large, large amounts. Now, understand something here. Back in that time, there wasn't a collection bag like we'll pass later, something that we call a generosity bag. It wasn't like that. And there wasn't one place where you deposited uh, your donations, your gifts, back in the temple. There were actually 13 different boxes. And those 13 different wood boxes or buckets um, had like this funnel-shaped bronze funnel in it. So wooden box with bronze funnel, almost like a trumpet, and it would just go down like this. And so you had people coming in, literally going like this. They, they're going to hit every box. Bing, 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 bing. I mean, this was like the more you put in, but you could have a lot in your hand. It's kind of like, okay, you, you could have... You could put in a dollar bill, but if you put in a hundred pennies, trust me, that's going to make more money, right? And so you got people, it's like basketball to them. Boomba, boomba, they're sinking it, man. They're making noise. Observation, God is always aware. What this taught me as I was studying is, is God is perfectly seated to know what we are doing or what we are not doing with our time, our talents, and our treasure. There is no hiding. And so Jesus is sitting there and he's watching people coming in and they're making noise. They're hitting every one of the wooden buckets that's got this bronze funnel in it. It's making noise. And then look, then a poor widow came and dropped in Two small coins. You can, you can almost feel it that she didn't come in pompously. She comes in and very, almost discreetly, tink, tink. Wait a second. Timothy and others who were pastors in the New Testament, they said, it's the widows that need to be looked out for, supplied for. In the book of James, brother of Jesus wrote, religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is to help the orphans and widows in their distress. This woman, she didn't give the largest gift, but she gave the most significant gift. Now let's go on. In fact, could we read this out loud together? You read it. I, let's read it out. I want to be able to hear you. Let's go. Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I tell you the truth. This poor widow has given more than all the others who are making contributions. Jesus is there watching all the fanfare, watches this widow, hunched shouldered, come in, drop in a little bit of money. He goes, hey, Peter. Bartholomew, Andrew, John, James, boys, bring it on in. You're not going to believe this one. You got to hear this. I can't wait to tell you this. This is an aha moment. 
That woman gave more than all of the other ones. <laughs> the disciples are thinking this. They're not going to say it to Jesus, but they're going, hey, Jesus, you know, let me tell you, you got a lot of your stuff together. You walk on water, you heal people, you took a few loaves and a few fish, you multiplied it, but your math skills here are a little subject. You've gone a little bit, so, you've, you've gone a little bit south with your math skills right here. Look what it says. For they gave a tiny part of their surplus, but she, poor as she is, gave everything she had to live on. I'd never seen this before. Those that gave a lot could have given more. And she had very little to give and she gave everything. They gave out a surplus. She didn't know where her next meal was coming from. Observation, it's always a heart issue, not an amount issue. She was all in with her devotion and motivation, her humility. When my um, dad passed away and before he passed away, he had set up all of his accounts with my name on it. And I, I knew a little bit about my dad's account. My dad didn't have a lot of money, wasn't making a lot of money, being retired, that kind of thing. But when I was cleaning up his books and everything and I got to his uh, checkbook. My dad, out of his social security and the little bit, and it was little that he had in retirement, was giving away 25 to 30% of his income every paycheck. Heart was right. This property that you sit on today, not the building, but the property. When we bought the property, we didn't have the money and somebody from this church lent us the money without interest. I went away on a trip to visit one of our ministry partners, was coming back, finally got back into internet range and started going through my emails, delete, delete, save, respond to quickly, and then there was this. Um, Terry, um, it was an email. I could almost read it to you verbatim. Um, just want you to know that we've read the book that you gave us called The Treasure Principle. It really is a hard issue. We don't know why people give away money when they die. That loan of $340,000 is no longer a loan. It's a gift. It's a gift. It's always a hard issue. And you know what there is in that? Generosity is so freeing. This talk isn't about what the church can get from you. It's about what God wants to give to you when you and I, our priorities are aligned with his. It's when we have a teachable spirit, a grateful spirit. And students that you're sitting here, I didn't share this in the first experience. When I was your age, when I was in middle school, my parents challenged me to give 10% of everything I made away to the Lord. I've never stopped doing that. I've never regretted it one time. And I've always had more than I've needed and now my wife and I are way beyond 10%. And if you do that with your babysitting money, you do that with the first job you get, you always give God what he deserves first. I guarantee you, I guarantee you, you will not have financial issues because you're putting God first. You're putting God first. Why? Because when we really recognize who Jesus is and what he's done in our lives, 
we want to follow his example and give back to him with our time, our talents, and our treasures. One of my favorite verses in the Bible comes from that great book of wisdom, Practical Living Principles. Proverbs eleven twenty five says, The generous will prosper. Those who refresh others, they themselves will be refreshed. We don't give so we get, but we go to refresh others. We've been, we've been blessed by the blesser to be a blessing. Anything we have comes from God. There's, there's a family who attends this church, and uh, uh, we, we had a need here, and this particular family said, we're going to meet that need. We are going to help our church out. And they gave, uh, uh, this individual gave me a figure that was staggering, that was staggering, and said, in so many months, my wife and I are going to give this gift. I'll work harder. I'll have my guys work harder. I'll have my teams work harder. That's the amount of money we're going to give. Two months before that date was, that individual came in, handed this church so that this church could continue with what God's called them to do, and the individual as they were, and I'm not even going to tell you the amount, handed a check over that was absolutely unbelievable and said, of all the toys I've ever bought, of all the cars I've ever bought, of all the things that I bought for pleasure, of all the house that I bought, I've never had more joy ever than giving this check right now to what God wants me to give. It's freeing. It's freeing. <laughs> Observation, we never look more like Jesus than when we are being generous. My wife and I, our greatest joys is saying, how can we give more money away each year? We make less, we give more. Jesus gave his life. Jesus gave to people. And when people grasp this concept that we have been given everything from God, it's not ours, it's his. He's given it to us to manage and to multiply. It's not mine. It's not yours. It's his to manage and to multiply. And you know what it helps us do? It helps us this, to keep the power of more in check, to keep the power of more away. What is more called greed. Why? Because Christ brings contentment, cash does not. The closer we get to Jesus, the more we want to look out for what he looks out for, the more we're create, connected with that creative God. Guess what? Our wants fade and contentment grows. A while back, um, one of my running buddies, we were going down to, um, to pick up our bibs and to pick up our... Uh, uh, our race paraphernalia, whatever. And uh, he said, hey, let me drive. And I, I saw his car, and it was kind of like a little sports car. It wasn't new, but it was, I said, hey, nice car. He goes, yep, it's my freedom car. I said, what, what do you mean it's your freedom car? He goes, well, number one, it's a 2008. We weren't going to go into debt, and we feel free. It's my freedom car. I was so proud of this couple, I could tell you what their name is. It wasn't like I need the next car, it, I, I, the newest and the best car. I'm going to go out and lease something to get something that I really can't afford. No, I want no payment because we want to live free. That is my freedom car. Isn't that incredible? It's my freedom car. <laughs> Observation. Some of you are going... Uh, if you haven't asked Jesus Christ to come into your life, please ask him to come into your life. If you've asked Jesus Christ to come into your life, there was a reason that Jesus spoke about money so much, stuff and possessions, because he knew that it would be the very thing that would hold people back from experiencing Jesus in the way that Jesus can be experienced, the power of God, the promises of God in their life. And when people begin to say, it's not mine, it's his, I'll do what God wants me to do. Guess what? God doesn't need something from you. God wants something for you. 
He wants to take away any obstacle that is holding you back from seeing God the way God can be seen and working in your life in a way that he's never worked before. C.S. Lewis, unbelievable follower of Jesus, author, thinker, look what he said. If our charities do not at all pinch or hamper us, I should say they are too small. There ought to be things we should like to do and cannot do because of our charities. Because our charities, those expenditures, they exclude them. Will you be generous? Will you? We've been blessed by the blesser to be a blessing. Which means we don't live like this, we live like this. So how is that applicable for today? Well, maybe you're sitting here and you go, I wasn't planning on this, but God's speaking to me and I'm gonna do something I've never done before to help the year end. For those of you who don't know Jesus, for those of you who are new to the faith and you go, whoa, 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 this, this, this is strange to me. Just go for 90 days and give God at least 10% of what you make, 10%. If it doesn't work after 90 days, abort. It won't happen. You can never outgive God. And for those of you who are here, maybe you've been, and you go, you know what? I get to be part, I, I can take my, I can take what God's given me, multiply it with what God's given other people in this church so we can continue to have impact. The, the day camp that's coming up into July, 1st of August, that, that, that is also supplemented by what you give to the Fencher Fund. We charge something that is so minimal so that we can have more kids come so the price isn't prohibitive. This church, your church, we help supply that. Because God's called us to have impact locally, regionally, nationally, and internationally. And I want um, a good friend of mine, he's been on this stage before, and he has a message to share with us right now, Julius. I'm Julius Murgor from Kenya, uh, among a tribe called Pokot, uh, who live in the northwest of Kenya. And uh, I grew up among these people. At the age of about uh, 12, 13 years, I lost interest in looking after cows. I was dragged away to go to school. I thank God today for not being interested in cows because God showed me other cows that he wanted me to take care of, and that is the church. Uh, we have prioritized sinking of wells because uh, there is a very close parallel between water uh, for drinking and living water. There is no water in Pokot land, and so we wanted to help the people physically by providing water. And then secondly, part of the reason is that we wanted to stamp out typhoid, which is a, a killer disease that kills the people from drinking contaminated water, which is all they have. And therefore, uh, God has given us success in that uh, wherever we have a water well, uh, typhoid is completely stamped out and uh, you see a lot of healthiness on the faces of the people. And so as we provide water for them to drink, which is, uh, you know, for the body, we also introduce them to the living water, which is Jesus Christ. We plant churches among them after providing uh, uh, water because we want them to know that this water has been provided by uh, Christ, uh, by the Lord. Uh, we have seen lives change and uh, uh, people touched and people uh, depending on Christ, even if they are going uh, through a lot of difficulties. It's when they see that a church is coming, sometimes I hear them asking themselves as to why have people from far away, why would they spend their resources and come all the way to see us? And they give themselves the answer as to uh, God being in their lives. And therefore, that love for God 
has helped them to love us, the Pokots. And so uh, 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 clearly it uh, uh, signifies God's love for all the people. In the minds of people when they first see clean water coming out of a, a well, God himself has come into that village that has a fountain or a borehole. Uh, and everybody dances and uh, uh, everybody uh, becomes very joyful and very happy. Uh, over the years uh, that I've been in the ministry, one of uh, my greatest joy is to see uh, people change. Well, I would like to uh, say uh, finally that uh, to, to thank the church uh, through the pastor. I thank this church very much uh, for coming our way uh, in that uh, they have established a station among us and they have visited us, they have shared uh, their resources with us and uh, time uh, because of the visits from time to time. And so I thank uh, God for you, uh, the church, and for you, the pastor, and everybody, and pray for um, uh, the future in our partnership that God uh, will continue to bless and touch lives. Thank you very much.